Joining us now with some key takeaways and what he's expecting when the rest of the big name financials report next week is David George, the senior analyst at uh, Baird. He covers J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo. And as I just mentioned, you're looking at Wells actually, well, Citi up the most at 2.62 percent right now. Wells up about 2.29 and J.P.M., uh, which is probably done, frankly, the best over all that period, though, uh, just up about a percent. David, uh, your, your impressions and, and most importantly, the takeaways as you sort of individually go through these stocks and what they're going to mean, not just for these three companies, but actually for the banks that we're going to be hearing about next week and the larger economy. Sure. Good morning, Andrew, and I uh, uh, hope you're doing well. Appreciate you having me on. These earnings this morning, despite uh, all of the sentiment and rhetoric around a, a so-called banking crisis, we had uh, J.P. Morgan did $13 billion of earnings. Wells Fargo did $6 billion. PNC, almost $2 billion just in the last three months. So, so from our perspective, despite all of the negative rhetoric surrounding these companies, I think these numbers are really proving uh, the resiliency of these business models and their ability to absorb not only higher deposit cost, Andrew, but also a higher credit cost as, uh, as the economy normalizes uh, following all the COVID stimulus and removal of that stimulus. So when you break down, though, the JPM results, the Wells Fargo results, or city, city results, you know, what does this portend when we hear from Goldman Sachs, when we hear from Morgan Stanley? Is there a takeaway here? Well, we don't cover Goldman or Morgan, but we do think that the capital markets activities are going to be reasonably healthy. Investment banking revenues at J.P. Morgan were up in the double digits. FIC was relatively good. Equities were down about 10 percent. So it's going to be kind of a flat, as you know, seasonally, obviously, the July and August time frame. Uh, is, is a little slow. So there's some comp issues on a sequential quarter basis. But again, given where the stocks are trading, expectations we think are relatively low. And I think we're starting to see uh, hopefully some green shoots uh, with respect to uh, investment banking and capital right. markets activity going into 2024. How do you feel about the regional banks right now? We also heard from PNC. I know there's been a, a lot of concern, or at least I should say after SVB, there was a lot of concern about the regional banks. And a lot of folks said, look, we're going to get to 2024. 2025, all of a sudden it's going to get complicated when you start to look at some of the real estate issues that, uh, that they may very well have, except for the fact that most people have sort of stopped. That conversation has, has almost stopped, and I don't know if that stopped for a good reason or not. Yeah, we feel pretty good about the regional banks, and that's really where, from a stock perspective, Andrew, where we think the opportunity lies, that the regional banks are extremely cheap. Many of them are six, seven times earnings or two times to four times pre-provision earnings, which is really the pre-credit earnings. And as you said, deposit flows or the deposit flight panic that we experience in that March, April, May timeframe has largely subsided. And we think over the next few quarters, you're going to see a bottom in net interest income. And there's actually a positive repricing benefit that we expect to see uh, in the form of, of higher loan yields, higher securities yields as banks feel the benefit of, uh, of loan repricing and asset repricing over the next four to six quarters or so. You want to pick one? We got PNC, PacWest, First Horizon, Zions, and uh, U.S. Bancor. You like one the most? Uh, our, our, yeah, our favorites, Andrew, are uh, Truist and Comerica. Uh, Truist uh -huh. is, uh, from our perspective, extremely cheap and has got extremely, uh, extremely good upside. We think 60 to 70 percent upside. Comerica would also be one of our favorites as well. And Wells Fargo uh, is our favorite in the big cap, uh, mega cap group as well. Why do you think the Wells Fargo has just not, not, not moved as much as I think people? I mean, Wells Fargo has been like the great hope for a very long time, and yeah. uh, that hope is yet to be realized. Why do you think that is? Yeah, the stock has actually done okay um, on a year-to-date basis. It's outperformed yep. many of the regional banks, and, and actually, they continue to make a lot of progress on the cost side. Obviously, this regulatory headwind has been has been much uh, much longer than any of us could have ever anticipated. I think we're working on almost six or seven years of this regulatory headwind. But uh, as a practical matter, this deposit cap has actually really helped them uh, in this Silicon Valley kind of fallout. Uh, they had to work out a lot of what I would call non-operational deposits over the last couple of years. So that has positioned them um, as a counterparty mm -hmm. of choice, actually, on the West Coast. So, so we're actually quite optimistic okay. on Wells. And, and, uh, uh, and the progress they're making. We got basically 30 seconds left, but uh, what is the JPM number to the degree it does, it does portend for Bank of America? Um, I, I think it's going to be, if, if, I, if, if I had to point to one thing, I think capital markets is going to be reasonably good, and, and the net interest income trends uh, at J.P. Morgan were also encouraging, as was credit quality, particularly on the consumer side. So I would say net interest income and credit will be positive. I would expect B of A, Andrew, to trade up today on the heels of J.P. Morgan's numbers.